Hello, and welcome to Euro Practices webinar series on silicon photonics. I'm Ramzi Saleem from Tyndall National Institute, part of Euro Practice Services, where we work on the full range of silicon photonics from design to fabrication, advanced packaging, and system integration. Before we begin today's talk, let me remind you that you can ask questions by using the Q&A button. These questions can be throughout the talks or at the end of the talks. And um, we will collate these questions and after the keynote talks are over, we'll have a dedicated Q&A session to answer your questions. Today um, is our last episode in what has been a fantastic webinar series on silicon photonics where you've heard firsthand from foundries from around the world, all which you can access right here through your practice. And we've saved this super special talk to the very last episode where, uh, where you're in for a treat. Today, you'll hear about Cornerstone's Silicon Photonics rapid prototyping capabilities. This foundry is, a, is based at the University of Southampton in the UK. They were established to give processing flexibility to you, enabling device level innovation. Later on, I'll tell you how you can access these services through your practice. We have with us today, um, they'll be joining us in a moment, our, um, Professor Graham Reed from um, University of Southampton. They'll be joining shortly as well as Dr. Callum Littlejohns. So um, Professor Graham is the Deputy Director of Optoelectronics Research Centre at the University of Southampton and leader of Cornerstone. And we've also will be will joining us will be Dr. Callum Littlejohns, uh, who is PhD in silicon photonics and is the Cornerstone Coordinator. Uh, I think over and talk about the details. Um, and as you see, this is uh, is uh, listing us both um, as, as speakers here. So this is broadly um, what our uh, presentation contains. So I will do the first two bullet points, the introduction to Cornerstone, really the background, <clears throat> and to my group, which is where Cornerstone is hosted. Um, so you can see um, from the map that Cornerstone is based in the UK. It's a silicon photonics rapid prototyping service and it's run by the universities of Southampton and Glasgow. And in a previous iteration of Cornerstone, the University of Surrey was also involved, which is why there's a third dot on this, uh, on this UK map showing Guildford which is where the University of Surrey is. So we continue to use them for the iron implantation part of the processes. And so why did we really set up Cornerstone? Um, the, the principal reason was I, I used to be a, a big user of many foundries around the world before I joined Southampton. Um, and those foundries in the, in the beginning of silicon photonics, you, you may know that I've been in silicon photonics for a fairly long time. Um, but they were, they, there was a great deal of flexibility initially. And as silicon photonics has evolved and become you know, essentially a, a, a commercial commodity, um, the flexibility for a researcher in some of the foundries has, has reduced because of you know, standardization, perfectly logical. But given that uh, the universities serve the research community, what we were really looking to do was bring back um, some of the flexibility to the research community um, to enable to do um, them to do device innovation, for example. They wanted to try a new modulator in, in, a, in a somewhat different platform, let's say, that sort of thing. And the other thing we aim to do is to do rapid prototyping so that uh, people can indeed uh, get their, the results of, of the first devices relatively quickly. Now, as I said, the, uh, the Cornerstone facility is based within my research group at the University of Southampton. We have, um, for a university, what is an incredibly good fab. Um, and we have also a large team of people 
the, the number of the of the people typically is around about 50. Um, this is a photo that was taken a few years ago. So any of you who know my group will probably be able to spot that a good number of these people are now moved on to different uh, jobs around the world. Um, but the number is roughly speaking the same. We sort of sit around about the 50 mark. And so the numbers are around the same, but the faces are, are somewhat different. And of course, some of the, the core faces are still the same. <clears throat> and the split is of the current uh, grouping is shown here. But, and again, that doesn't change um, a huge amount. So we have predominantly uh, PDRAs, postdoctoral research uh, uh, re um, fellows, and a, a sort of good number of students and some support technicians and so on. Um, we have quite a lot of experience of silicon photonics. Uh, I, I started the group back in 1989. Uh, we made our first modulator, I think, in 90 or 91. I can't actually remember exactly. And so um, there's a fair bit of background there. And here are just some of the statistics um, associated with the group there. <clears throat> uh, perhaps something that's worth saying is that the capabilities of the group are obviously uh, aimed at the research uh, activity that we, we uh, engage in. Um, but of course, if you are a potential customer of Cornerstone, you may um, have a strong silicon photonics background or you may have no silicon photonics background. So something that we can do over and above um, the MPW process that's, uh, that's held within Cornerstone is we can do any of these things for you. Oh, excuse me, I've uh, inadvertently uh, pressed too soon. We can do any of these type of activities for you um, alongside uh, a Cornerstone run. If you wanted um, you know, some support perhaps in the design and modeling um, or in perhaps the, uh, the measurement of your devices or indeed the integration with um, other things such as electronics or um, you know maybe some sort of other device integration um, or, or you know support structures or whatever it is such as interposers you know that sort of thing. Um, so we can sort of support you by putting that whole uh, group of expertise onto your project for a relatively short period of time uh, in, in a way that I think perhaps makes us a little bit more distinctive um, and more focused on that research type environment than um, perhaps a conventional foundry might be. So in terms of some of the specific um, testing capability that we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have um, high speed testing principally uh, aimed at our modulator work. Uh, but you can see there's a whole raft of, um, of uh, capability there surrounding uh, data comm and, and telecom type of, of um, applications. But for what it's worth, and you'll see from Callum shortly, we are also active in the research field in uh, a lot of other emerging um, silicon photonics applications, such as things like LiDAR or uh, mid-infrared. Um, there's some quantum work and so on and so forth. So um, although this capability is aimed primarily at, uh, at Telecom Datacom because that's what most of the Cornerstone um, users are currently looking at, you'll see there are a few things like this large wavelength range, which is, which is more sort of uh, looking at um, emerging applications such as sensors and that sort of thing. We also have um, uh, capability that is derived really from our research activity. So for example, we've been working quite a lot lately on wafer scale testing and programmable photonics. And that's why we have uh, a FICONTECH wafer scale tester. So we've developed it with them as part of our research program. But of course, what we can now do is um, put that to, to work for your project if that's what you need. Uh, and so we have the benefits of what's coming out of our research program uh, can feed and support and even go alongside some of the cornerstone activities. Um, so here's a case study. 
So it says case study one because Callum's going to uh, talk further later when he takes over. So this is just one example and, and um, those who know my group will also probably know that uh, we work fairly closely with Rockley Photonics. Um, Andrew Rickman, the, uh, the CEO, was uh, back in the day was one of my uh, PhD students, I'm actually my first PhD student. Uh, and we're now working again very closely with Rockley and we have a, um, a, a big multi-million pound project that uh, is called a Prosperity Partnership, which is something that is supported um, via the UK government and Rockley in the UK. And so these are the, some, of, some of the things that, uh, um, that Andrew has said in the past. Um, and so the, the purpose of putting this up is to show you that whilst um, what we're talking about predominantly today is, is Cornerstone, this is another example of a, an activity that might originate with some, um, some work in Cornerstone or indeed in, in another way that we can run alongside, in this case as a research project or perhaps as uh, some sort of development project or an enterprise project. And I'm sure Callum will, will mention a little of that uh, as we go along. So um, that's where I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over to Callum. So I, I'm going to focus on on the you know the core cornerstone activity and the fabrication services that we offer. Um, so Graham's obviously given a bit of a background about why we set up cornerstone in the first place. Um, but and this slide is just intended to give you a, a little bit more detail. So our our platform is truly open source, and by that we mean all of our PDK and standard designs and everything are available to download for free on our website without the need to sign any license agreements. So again, this is some in a way that we're different to the other foundries. Um, and being, you know, dedicated to the research side of things, this is really important to us that we do have this open access um, model. And Graham's already mentioned, we, we make sure everything's very versatile. Although of course in MPW, there are common processes we do let you customize certain steps within that, you know, without having to do an entirely bespoke run. But of course, if you do require a bespoke run, then it is something we can do as well, up to sort of small volumes. Um, and a crucial thing we offer is uh, most of our MPW works based on DPV lithography. So it is obviously scalable to, um, you know, your other favorite foundries further down the line. So the, the technology transfer, if you do want to go to higher volumes, is quite straightforward. Um, but we do also have a unique capability to combine DBV and e-beam lithography. Um, and I'm going to give you an example later on about when we've done that. But this means that we're able to mimic the more advanced technology nodes in some way, in terms of resolution at least. Um, it might not mean you get the same losses from waveguides as you would for say a 12 inch line, but at least we can mimic the resolution. Um, and what we'll do is only write the small features with e-beam and do everything else on the scanner. So we don't lose the whole like um, volume aspect of it. So that's just a few ways in which we think Cornerstone is different to um, other foundries you might be familiar with. So Graham's already mentioned the partners. Um, the core partners are Southampton and Glasgow. We do also work with Surrey for iron and plantation. So all of the wafer scale processing within Cornerstone will happen at Southampton. Um, and it's all eight inch, just to be make sure you're aware of that. Um, so we have all of the standard sort of tools you'd expect from a, a CMOS fab, with the exception of the implantation, hence why University of Surrey are involved. And again, being a university and research focused, it does mean that they let you implant almost every element you can find on the periodic table. Um, so it, it kind of emphasizing the, the whole flexibility element. And we partner with Glasgow, they do work on e-beam and chip level lithography. So anything that is considered like a higher risk, you might just want a couple of chips instead of a full MPW run and, and, you, and Glasgow can, can provide that. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail about some new capability we're developing and Glasgow are involved there as well, but that's coming up in, in future slides. So this is just some basic examples of the types of things we can do. I'm sure you're familiar with, 
with this anyway. So these are some passive devices we've developed in the past. So anything just based on waveguides, spectrometers, resonant devices, etc. And we can integrate heaters to form phase shifters for things like um, programmable photonics. And this is an example of some work we did a few years ago now with um, Jose Catmany's group um, in based in Spain. So th this was one of the earlier stages of the, the whole programmable photonics um, work that's developed a lot in the past few years. So here, this design was based just on thermal phase shifters um, and it formed a mesh, um, just a, a mesh of ring resonators effectively um, that are tunable couplers and tunable Max Zender interferometers. And um, Jose's team managed to demonstrate over 20 different functionalities using the same um, device, just programming it in different ways. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with this field now. It's emerged quite a lot over the past few years. Um, but all of this processing happened within our facilities at Cornerstone, including the bonding, which you can see in the images on the top right. I think this had something like 150 or 200 wire bonds so that you could individually control each of the different um, tunable elements of the circuit. So we, we also do active devices. Um, and here's a few examples. So we do carrier based modulators. Um, typically these would be depletion type um, if you're trying to optimize for speed. Obviously we can also make injection modulators in the same process if, if desired. Um, and we've demonstrated up to 56 gigabit a second with on off keying. Um, this eye diagram you can see here is actually at 13, 10 nanometers. Um, but we've got comparable data at 1550 as well. And just to show underneath, we have um, applied some more advanced modulation techniques. This is some work we did with Huawei. Um, so this, you know, the eye diagrams aren't that special, but we were limited in terms of the input signal we had in this case. So going back to the whole idea of flexibility and, um, you know, offering lots of different things, we have we don't just focus on one SOI platform. So we have three different silicon thicknesses. Um, and this is so that you can optimize different parameters. So the 220 is really aimed at telecom work, datacom applications. Um, and the 340 is more, you know, it's intended to be slightly lower loss. So for example, you can get better coupling efficiencies into 340. Um, so this is useful in many applications, but particularly maybe quantum photonics and things like that. You can get better coupling, lower loss waveguides. And the 500 nanometer platform is thinking towards mid infrared wavelengths. So SOI can support wavelengths up to something around four microns. Um, and with this 500 nanometer thickness, you can, you can support wavelengths up to that. Um, and we have a device library of sort of your standard passive and active components. So we, we run two different MPW cool types. One of them we call passives. So this is up to three silicon etches and heaters, which is optional. So I'll show you the prices in a moment. You can either just have wave guys with no heaters or for a slightly extra cost, you can add heaters on the top. So within the passive runs, you always have the choice of whether you add heaters or not. And we run that, um, I'll show you the schedule coming up as well. We run that in a cycle of different platforms. So we don't always run the same platform. We kind of alternate. Um, and then about, so we run about four of those a year. And then about twice a year, we run the active device runs where we have the same functionality, but we also have all these implantation steps so that you can make carrier based modulators. Um, and this one's only based on 220 at the moment, but we do have the capability to do that on other platforms if there is a demand. So we're always open to changing. If, if the demand's there for other platforms, then you know, we're open to, to going down those routes as well. So all of our design rules, PDK, everything, some of the conditions is all available via the Cornerstone website. Um, and you know, 
access to that can be facilitated through through Euro practice. So we don't, I've mentioned this already, we don't just run MPW, we sometimes, we can do bespoke fabrication if you want. I'm sure you're all aware of the pros and cons of each. The MPW is obviously way a lot cheaper, but slightly less flexible. But like we've already said a couple of times, you can customize certain steps if you're worried about cost. Um, but if, if you want to run entire wafers, we can, and this obviously gives you advantages like you can do um, you can do sweeps for optimization and things like that. You get a much bigger design area. You get full customization of the flow. Um, we, we have a standard PDK available in GDS format from our website. We do also partner with Lucida Photonics. Um, I'm sure many of you have used them in the past. So all of our standard components are also built into their software. So if you have a license with them, then you can download our PDK. Or if you don't have a license with them, then you can contact them via their, their website um, and, and download their RPDK using their software. So this is just, I won't go into the details, but this is just to say that we have standard components at multiple wavelengths on all of the platforms. So this is just another quick case study that we've done um, with Tyndall fairly recently. So this is where we've used E-beam um, to, to achieve much smaller dimensions than we can achieve using deep UV lithography. So this is some work by um, Luca Zagaglia and Francesco Flores at Tyndall. Um, they designed some grating couplers that are optimized either for vertical coupling, which is kind of your standard lab setup, or for horizontal coupling using horizontal fibers, like you can see in the figure in the top right here. So the, the design slightly changes if you want to optimize for that particular arrangement. And the data is shown underneath. So um, they've demonstrated these couplers on various different thicknesses of SOI, but focusing on 220, um, they've shown a, a packaged, um, coupling efficiency of 2.5 dB using the horizontal fiber arrangement. And if we go to the 340 nanometer SOI, then using the horizontal fibers, they've shown 0.8 dB insertion loss per coupler. And using the vertical fibers is even better at 0.7 dB. So this is just to emphasize, like I said earlier, that these are some of the reasons we offer 340, because you can get quite a significant improvement in creating coupler efficiency. And I think the 1 dB bandwidth you can see here is sort of um, of the order of 20 or 30 nanometers. So this is our schedule for next year. You'll notice we split into four different types. It's the different SOI thicknesses and whether it's an active run or a passive run. Um, this next deadline is December of this year and running into 2021. So these are the mask submission deadlines. Um, and the sign-up deadline is four weeks before this. This will all be made clear when we release the design documents for each one. And this is this this schedule is available on the Europractice website. In terms of cost, again, we offer two different design areas. So you can either have a full block or half a block that's slightly cheaper. Um, so the standard for these prices is 10 replica die. Per, per run. If you require more than that, then the costs are listed at the bottom. So um, we can offer you 20, 30, 40 copies of the same design if, if that's what you want. So that's what we have at this moment in time available. Um, I just want to give you a, a bit of an overview about what we're working on in the future. So this Cornerstone 2 is a project is funded by EPSRC, which is the UK um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, and within this project, we're developing new photonic platforms beyond just SOI. So these are targeting all of the emerging applications you're aware of um, that either have new functionality at telecom wavelengths or they're targeting other wavelengths. 
Um, so for example, we have suspended silicon platform that can be used to support wavelengths up to about eight microns for mid IR sensing, for example. If you're interested in even longer wavelengths than that, we, we have a germanium on silicon platform um, where you can support wavelengths up to about 14 microns. Again, this is useful for sensing, as you probably know, a lot of gases and interesting materials and compounds have the fingerprint region in the mid IR wavelengths. Um, so these platforms kind of attack those application spaces. And we're also developing a silicon nitride platform that um, means you can do visible wavelengths as well. So we're going sort of both ways in terms of the wavelength range we, we can um, help you to fabricate. And this is the final case study I just wanted to share, um, something slightly different you might be used to. So this is carrier-based modulators at the mid-IR wavelengths. So this is up to 3.8 micron. And the effects, um, both the electroabsorption and electrorefraction are significantly stronger at these mid-IR wavelengths. So what it means is you can make more efficient devices um, that are shorter. So the data here is quite slow and that was just because we had quite a conservative design as it was our first attempt where the separation between the doping was quite large because obviously with these bigger wavelengths, the mode size is bigger. So you have to be slightly more concerned with losses for the, for the contacts. Um, but this could be useful for things like um, on-chip, um, you know, on-chip chopper for, for mid-IR sensing and things like that. So it's a, a, a sort of switch where you don't need very high speed that you might hit for telecoms. So we can get sort of 100 megabit type speeds, which is probably acceptable for that type of application. So it might be an on-chip clock and stuff like that for your, for your sensing chips. So that's it, this is my conclusion. Um, so this just highlights four key points that we'd like to emphasize. Um, so we're a rapid prototyping facility. We're really targeting the low TRL levels, sort of university researchers and, um, you know, startups, this type of thing. Sometimes it can be, we do work with big companies as well, but more on the research side as opposed to production. Um, but the key thing is that all of the processes we use are scalable. So it means that the scale up is simplified. So we don't exclusively rely on eBeam, which you might find at other sort of prototyping founders. If you go to our website, europractice-ic.com, and you can find there the various type of technologies that Cornerstone uh, provide through Europractice. So um, you build, there's things like, um, it's all SOI platform, 200 uh, and uh, millimeter wafers and uh, there's 220 nanometer thickness, um, 340 nanometer thickness and 500 nanometer thickness which you'll be hearing about um, in this talk and the various capabilities that they offer and what that means for your devices as well. So yeah you can go ahead to the website you can find out more there about how you can access um, the slot that you're interested in. In fact uh, some of the schedule runs available. So in December of 2020, so the 18th of December, there is a scheduled run for 340 nanometer silicon on insulator uh, passive devices. So, uh, so this is kind of waveguides, and um, it could be things like ring resonators, um, optical splitters, that kind of stuff. And um, you can access that, but remember you need to register for it um, about four weeks in advance. So within the next month or so, just let me know. You can drop me an email on europractice.gateway at tyndall.ie. And that way um, you can let me know that you're interested in this run um, and we can book that slot for you to, to get you ready for it as well. In 2021, the schedule's out. So if you're planning or you're interested in accessing the services in 2021, there's already a full kind of layout for next year, uh, especially maybe some key dates here are the 26th of March is the first run in 2021, 
where it's a 220 nanometer SOI passives and actives. So there's two runs then, um, active devices that may be of interest for you, but also uh, passive devices as well, which is quite popular as well. So 26th of March is one of the key dates. Remember, you need to uh, register a month in advance. So again, just drop me an email at um, europractice.gateway at tindall.ie. It's at the bottom there. Um, so that, that could help could help you. And uh, some other information for you that you can find out what's going on. Uh, so like I'm saying, this is the last in the series. So in order for you to find out what's going on in Q1 and Q2 and what the next webinar series we're setting up and um, doing, LinkedIn is a great place to find that out. We tend to put a lot of our updates through there. Uh, email, we do that as well. Uh, LinkedIn is uh, easy enough for you to just head over there and follow your practice on LinkedIn for the live updates. Uh, YouTube, now we're doing something a bit different for YouTube. It's not just gonna be recorded material. And in early next year, there will be also exclusive material for subscribers where only subscribers will get the notification about this new material that they can watch and they can get the link to. Uh, this may be in the form of um, um, bite-sized virtual training material. So make sure you go ahead and um, hit the subscribe button for our YouTube channel. And again, if you have any questions for me for throughout this webinar series on any of the other different topics, or even if you've got it for a different foundry, you can contact me. I'll try to put you in touch with the right person. Um, again, it's at europractice.gateway at tindall.ie.